Emergency airway management is a high-risk procedure. In rare circumstances, after the induction of anaesthesia, it may be impossible to either intubate or ventilate the patient, even with full adjunctive measures in place. When the patient desaturates, deterioration occurs quickly unless an alternate airway can be established. In this video, we will review the commonly described methods of emergency cricothyroidotomy. Okay, let's go. Intubation in the ICU and emergency environment is often performed in high-risk patients. The incidence of a can't intubate, can't ventilate scenario is significantly higher in this group than in elective anaesthesia, with some reports suggesting an incidence of 0.6% of all emergency intubations and up to 3% in patients with severe trauma. Difficult airway algorithms have been developed for this circumstance and frequently these end with emergency cricothyroidotomy. Though many variations on these procedures exist, in this video we will review three more commonly described methods. The cricothyroid membrane is chosen because of its ease of access and relative lack of vascular structures. The membrane is located anteriorly in the neck between the thyroid cartilage above and the cricoid cartilage below. It can be located by placing a finger on the thyroid prominence in the midline and then running the finger cordially until the horizontal groove is felt. This may be more difficult in children as the thyroid prominence is less well developed and better located by starting at the suprasternal notch palpating the tracheal rings until the prominent cricoid cartilage is felt. The size of the membrane varies with body size and in adults averages 14 mm vertically and 12.5 mm horizontally and in most adults can accommodate a 6 mm internal diameter tube. The vascular structures are along the superior edge so the recommended entry point is the lower border of the membrane. Bearing in mind that this procedure is almost always done in a crisis situation, some rapid preparations can be made to increase the chances of success. Firstly, the patient should be positioned to maximise access to the cricothyroid membrane. This usually involves hyperextension of the head and neck. This can sometimes be facilitated by placing a shoulder roll or pillow under the shoulders to allow the head to gently fall backwards. Where time permits, a modified sterile technique is implemented. This may be limited to sterile gloves and the application of antiseptic solutions. Ideally, all required equipment to be discussed soon should be available and in a position where they can be easily accessed by the operator. Needle cricothyroidotomy involves insertion of the cannula into the airway via the lower border of the cricothyroid membrane. This is thought to allow insufflation of oxygen directly into the airway with the intention of maintaining oxygenation while an alternative means of securing the airway is obtained. Once inserted, the cannula is attached to high flow oxygen. Moderately high gas pressures are required to overcome the resistance of such a small tube. To avoid hyperinflation, a device designed to allow intermittent inflation is required so that a period of exhalation may occur. A number of makeshift methods for this have been proposed. Commercial kits, such as the ENC and the Ventrain, are also available. It is important to recognise that this method allows for oxygenation only. Ventilation is not possible in any meaningful way. In most patients the chest is not expected to rise or fall and the CO2 will inevitably rise. As discussed previously however, to avoid hyperinflation a period of exhalation is still required. In most patients, the upper airway remains sufficiently patent to allow passive exhalation. In rare circumstances where the upper airway is completely obstructed, 
a second cannula can be inserted into the cricothyroid membrane. A prolonged inspiratory-expiratory ratio, such as 1 to 8, and lower inspiratory oxygen flow rates may be required. The Ventrain device reportedly actively facilitates exhalation using a Venturi-type action. The equipment required for a needle crocothyroidotomy includes a cannula attached to a syringe, some sterile saline, antiseptic wash, and a means of delivering oxygen intermittently. In this example, a three-way tap attached to oxygen tubing. Old-style, non-retractable cannulae, or purpose-built cannulae in commercial kits, should be used such that a syringe can be attached to its end. For adults, a 14 gauge is appropriate, while for children, a 16 to 18 gauge cannula is used. Entry into the trachea is confirmed by the aspiration of air into the syringe. Partly filling the syringe with sterile saline enables easy identification of this as demonstrated here. While securing the trachea with the non-dominant hand, the needle is introduced in a caudal direction at a 45 degree angle to the skin. The needle is carefully and slowly advanced while the syringe is aspirated continuously as the needle is introduced until air can be seen bubbling through the saline. Great care must be taken to avoid inadvertent puncture of the posterior wall of the trachea. This is particularly so in young children as the cartilages of the trachea are very soft and the trachea can be completely compressed by the needle if not careful. Stabilising the needle, the cannula can then be advanced into the airway. The three-way tap is secured, the oxygen tubing attached to a flow meter and the oxygen increased to 15 litres per minute. The three-way tap is positioned to open on all sides. In this position, the path of least resistance is through the open port. Insufflation of gas can occur by occluding this port for one second, followed by a period to allow expiration to occur, usually around three to four seconds. Repeating this cycle can maintain oxygenation for up to 20 minutes in some cases. Securing the catheter can be very difficult and may require a dedicated person to prevent kinking or dislodgement. Commercial kits such as this one have been developed to allow for easy delivery of the high flow oxygen to the patient. One end is connected via the lure lock to the catheter while the other is connected to the high flow oxygen. Oxygen is delivered by occluding the holes as shown here. The main complication of this method is misplacement of the tube. Studies have demonstrated a failure rate ranging from 20 to 60% for this technique. Inflation in this position may lead to gross surgical emphysema, rendering all other salvage methods virtually impossible. In addition, inadequate oxygenation, bleeding, hypercapnia, infection, airway damage and aspiration are potential complications. Insufficient exhalation may also lead to hyperinflation that can result in hemodynamic instability and barotrauma. A high level of vigilance for the development of pneumothorax is necessary. Because of these limitations, needle crocothyroidotomy is largely viewed as a temporising measure to buy time until other methods of airway access can be performed. Needle crocothyroidotomy remains the only emergency technique available to patients under the age of 12 years due to the higher risk of significant damage caused by alternate methods in this group. Lower flow rates in the range of 10 to 12 litres per minute should be used. A more reliable method may be to place a small calibre tube into the cricothyroid membrane. This can be performed either percutaneously using a modified Seldinger technique or surgically. 
percutaneous insertion of the cricothyroidotomy tube utilises the Seldinger technique made famous by its use in vascular access catheter insertion. The technique has the advantage of providing a bigger, cuffed tube that can be used for manual ventilation and for preventing aspiration. It also utilises a familiar skill set in the ICU and can be used to convert from a needle jet method described previously to a definitive airway. Commercial kits such as this one contain all the equipment required for the procedure. The patient is prepared in a fashion previously described for needle cricothyroidotomy. The equipment in the commercial kit should be prepared and readily accessible by the operator. The cricothyroidotomy tube must be well lubricated and loaded onto the dilator prior to insertion. This dilator assists in the development of a path for the tube to be inserted through. The syringe is partly filled with saline and attached to the needle. After preparations are complete, a needle is inserted into the cricothyroid membrane as described previously. A guide wire is then passed down the needle into the airway. There should be minimal resistance to the passage of the guide wire until the wire enters a bronchus. The needle can then be removed, carefully controlling the wire to ensure it is not dislodged. A small skin incision is made around the wire insertion point to facilitate the passage of the tube. The cricothyroidotomy tube, preloaded onto the dilator, is then fed onto the guide wire. Assistance may be required as ongoing control of the precious guide wire is essential. The tube can then be advanced over the guide wire into the airway using a rotating hand motion. The tip of the tube should be almost perpendicular to the membrane as it starts to enter the airway before a downward rotation carries the tip towards the carina. Once in place, the dilator and wire are withdrawn as one and the cuff is inflated. The position of the tube in the airway is confirmed via standard methods and the flange is secured before connecting the patient to the ventilator circuit. Complications of percutaneous cricothyroidotomy include damage to the airway and misplacement which can have catastrophic consequences. However, some studies have found it a more reliable method of securing the airway in a can't intubate, can't ventilate scenario than needle methods. Bleeding and infection may also occur. Cricothyroidotomy tubes can be left for up to 72 hours before formally being replaced with alternative means. Surgical cricothyroidotomy is a rapid and very reliable method of gaining emergent access to the airway. It involves an incision along the cricothyroid membrane, dilation and preservation of the tract, and insertion of a small cuff tube, usually a size 6 tracheostomy tube or smaller, into the airway. Because of the simplicity and reliability of the method, it is often recommended in difficult airway algorithms. A number of methods have been described that utilise horizontal or vertical incisions, or both, along with trachea hooks, dilators and scalpel handles to maintain the track, with no evidence for any one particular method. A simple, reliable method is presented here. The equipment required for a surgical tracheostomy includes a scalpel blade, dilators, a bougie, and a well-lubricated size 6 tracheostomy tube. Following the usual preparation of the patient, the trachea is stabilised with a non-dominant hand. The scalpel is inserted through the skin into the airway at the lower border of the cricothyroid membrane, and a single horizontal incision is made through all layers in one pass as shown. Care should be taken not to insert the blade too deeply damaging the posterior wall of the trachea. Do not take the blade out of the airway. 
a set of tracheostomy dilators can now be inserted using the blade to guide them into the airway. The blade can now be removed. The dilators can then be used to open the passage to the airway. A bougie is now inserted into the airway with the assistance of the dilators. A well lubricated size 6 tracheostomy tube or endotracheal tube can now be inserted into the airway over the bougie. Some authors favour excluding the bougie step and inserting the tube directly into the trachea with the assistance of the tracheostomy dilators. The cuff can now be inflated and the position of the tube confirmed in the usual fashion before securing and connecting to the ventilator circuit. Some authorities recommend an initial vertical incision. This reduces the risk of injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerves lying alongside the upper trachea at this level. Additionally, if the initial incision is inappropriately located either too high or too low, the incision can be extended easily. After gentle dissection with curved forceps, a horizontal incision through the cricothyroid membrane can now be made. The use of a trachea hook to control the trachea after the initial incision has been made has also been recommended, allowing for easier insertion of the dilator forceps. The most important complication associated with surgical cricothyroidotomy is disruption of the airway, esophageal perforation and mispositioning. Bleeding occurs more frequently than with other methods, but is rarely of great concern. Subcutaneous emphysema may occur if the incision is too wide and should be controlled with sutures. Unchecked, this complication can result in inadvertent dislodgement of the tube as the subcutaneous tissue between the trachea and the skin expands. In this video, we have demonstrated the commonly used methods for emergency cricothyroidotomy. Other methods exist, and it is important to discuss these with your supervisors and colleagues. Having reviewed these techniques, it is now time for the evaluation section, and then undertake a witnessed insertion attempt with your supervisor.